live stream today. Uh, I'm Kyle Dalton, the membership uh, and development coordinator. I'm here with John. Yes, it is I, John. <laughs> You're supposed to say your name and title, though. Oh yes, that's right. Uh, I I got I got too excited with saying it is I. Um, <laughs> It, it is I, John. Star, real professional. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very put together. Uh, it is I, John Lustria, the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's great to be with you all today. We're going to be talking today about the Civil War body. Uh, we're going to have to, of course, define what that means. Uh, but before we really get into it, uh, I do want to remind you that we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We are a museum. Uh, we provide these streams for free. Uh, we do them fairly often. Uh, we, we like having historians on here to talk to, presenting things that we're passionate about. That's what we're doing today. Uh, and we rely on you uh, to support us in this. Uh, we are supported by our members, uh, people who join and give an annual contribution. Uh, and you get benefits for that. We'd like to thank you for, for your support. We've had a lot of new supporters this year. A lot of you have joined because of these programs. And I'm sure we're going to see some, some, some uh, familiar faces in the chat today. Uh, so thank you to those of you who have given. Uh, if you haven't and you'd like to see more of this content, consider becoming a member. It's, it's the best way to support us. And as I said, we, we do have ways of thanking you. Uh, you get a subscription to our newsletter or journal. Uh, you get 10% off in our gift shop on every purchase and you get a special uh, discount coupon for whenever you want to stop by. Uh, free admission to all three of our locations. Clara Barton Missing Soldier's Office in Washington, D.C., which is now opened for private tours. Uh, so you can call ahead and, and make a, a reservation and you'll get a private tour there. Uh, our main location here in Frederick, uh, at least that's where I am, uh, it's uh, right here on, on East Patrick Street, uh, 8,000 square feet of exhibit space. And it's currently open Wednesday through Sunday. And finally, our uh, Pry Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield. Uh, the buildings are not currently open there, but the grounds are. So, so be sure to swing by and check it out. A membership gets you free admission to all of those, as well as the other benefits that, that I've already mentioned. Check out the link in the comments. If it's not there, we're going to put it up pretty quick. Uh, that's the, the best way you can support us. Uh, so please consider uh, giving us some help here uh, in these, these difficult times. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, we're going to get into the actual content today. Uh, John and I had talked about um, doing this thing. We, we do it only very occasionally, but we have a lot of fun doing it, where uh, two of us will sit down and one of us will just talk about something they're passionate about. Uh, so for me, you've probably seen a few of these videos where I talk about ambulances, stretcher bearers. There's, uh, we got a bunch of them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or Jake uh, talking about Dr. Letterman. Um, and, and we just kind of go back and forth and, and one of us will ask the other to kind of elaborate on the thing that they're passionate about. So as we were sitting in the office uh, talking about this, uh, John was like, hey, we're getting close to Halloween. Here's this idea that I've had uh, that I've always kind of stewed on. Uh, and that was the body, the civil war and the body. So John, could you tell us what do you mean by that? Yeah, so this, this all of this research that I've done, it's been, like you said, kind of stewing for, uh, for a while. This is one of the first projects I kind of tackled uh, when I started at the museum. And it's bringing into conversation uh, a couple different books, which I'd highly recommend. So um, I'm pulling back the curtain here. If you want to know basically everything I know about this subject, read these three books and you could do what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, I can't recommend these three enough. First of all, This Republic of Suffering by Drew Gilp and Faust, excellent volume. Um, uh, Traffic of Dead Bodies by Michael Saphol and Learning from the Wounded by Shauna Devine. Um, they you know, are kind of related, but they don't explicitly come into conversation with each other. So, I, I, and I think they very obviously feed into each other in this way. They all talk about the confluence of um, the Civil War, uh, which of course is something we talk a lot about, uh, dead bodies, uh, and exactly what the cultural idea of death was and how it relates to medical education. So uh, there's a lot going on there. We're gonna parse through all of that. Um, but basically what I'm trying to argue here is that the Civil War forever changed uh, how Americans viewed um, primarily dead bodies, but also just the human body in general. So uh, we'll get into exactly how that happens and why that happens over the course of uh, the program here. 
So when you say the body uh, today, as you said, it's not just death, but that's your primary focus. The body after life has ended. Because mm-hmm. I yes, remember for, I for, for, the, in, for the most part, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I took a course in college. It was the, the medieval body. Mm-hmm. And it was about like anything to do with bodies, relics. So again, dead people, uh, but also like martial arts, how the body is used. And I know in the historiography, it also deals with um, like bodily identity, uh, ethnic minorities, gender uh, or sex. Uh, but here you're, you're a little bit more narrow in your focus. You're mostly looking at dead bodies. What do they mean? Why do we care about them? What can they say? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And just like you said, this could very easily be expanded. Um, you know, the, the, the term body um, could be expanded to refer to, you know, much larger swath. But, but for this particular uh, stream here, we're going to use it primarily to refer to dead bodies. So uh, we do have somebody in the comments who asked uh, for that list of books again. Um, yes. Um, you, and we'll also put this in the comments uh, for later on uh, to make it a little easier to, to go back to. Yeah, that's a, a great idea. Um, I'll make sure and get that list together, perhaps even as we go along here. So uh, what was it that brought your attention to this particular topic? It is kind of a uh, niche <laughs> uh, interest. What was it that, that really caught your attention and why were you interested in corpses? <laughs> I'm just Great getting ready for the deposition that's definitely going to follow this. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, oh yeah, people ask me that all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I first started working at the museum, I sort of, you know, I, I have a, a couple degrees in history and I, I focused on the study of Civil War history for a large chunk of my life. And I sort of naively thought that I knew everything I needed to know about Civil War medicine, only to discover that I knew nothing about Civil War medicine. I, I didn't even know some of the basic things that we talk about regularly, like they had access to anesthesia um, uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, and they actually did kind of mostly know what they were doing and you know all that. I, I had all the classic misconceptions that you know uh, a lot of people, um, I think, can have about Civil War medicine, but what really kind of, once I course corrected on kind of some of the more basic information, something that really fascinated me um, was when I first picked up Shauna Devine's book, Learning from the Wounded. Uh, and one of the whole arguments is, uh, that, that she makes is um, that the Civil War uh, for the first time made America a producer of medical knowledge and not just a consumer of medical knowledge. And I thought that was certainly interesting. Uh, and I thought that, you know, people that study the Civil War should focus on that a lot more. That's a really cool thing to highlight. And how they did this was by studying um, both the living in Civil War hospitals, but also studying the dead um, through uh, dissections and things. And as she kind of details in the book, that past, uh, that history of medical dissection in this country is very fraught and very long, and the Civil War represents a major pivot point into how that was perceived. Um, so it all, so that's kind of what grabbed me. It was like, oh, this is really interesting and, and something that kind of forms the fabric of, you know, our country today, you know, in the way that we think about, you know, what happens to bodies. I mean, I think a lot of people, it, people don't bat an eye if they sign up, you know, to become an organ donor or something like there's a thing you can check like on your driver's license. I think there's just a like a little thing on there that, you know, if you're, you know, God forbid, um, you know, horrifically injured and, you know, you can't and you die and obviously you can't say there's just a little marks. So, I mean, but th- this would have been unheard of in the 19th century, a, a similar program. The, the backdrop for all of this uh, is, and you've, I'm sure heard us talk about this, uh, on you know these streams before the backdrop for all of this is this cultural idea in the 19th century of something called the good death um, and drew faust uh, expands on this greatly in this republic of suffering um, there were a few kind of components about what was and i'm using air quotes here what was supposed to happen when you died in the uh, in the 19th century uh, number one you ideally were supposed to be at home um, 
as late as 1900, uh, only 15% of Americans died outside of their home. Um, that's like, well, 120 years ago, which again, even that feels like a long time, but it's pretty recent uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so dying at home is, is pivotal here. Uh, secondly, you were surrounded by your family, your family and loved ones. Um, uh, third, they were there so that when you did die, they could hear your last words. Uh, and your last words were um, some sort of referendum on, you know, how you were ready to meet death. You'd led a good Christian life. Um, you know, you were prepared to go to heaven, all this sort of stuff. It, it was sort of like a, a, um, a, a, re, re, a reassurement to the family that, you know, you are indeed going to heaven, you were true to your beliefs, all, all this good stuff. And the uh, last words, too, that, that goes way back. There was mm -hmm. legal precedent in the 18th century. Hearsay could be admitted in court if it was the person's last words. Because they put that much weight on how you went into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also too, and this is sort of a, a, a cheesy um, descendant of that, but it's also why in like, you know, all these action movies where like the bad guy's got the good guy and he'll be like, any last words? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's supposed to be that the idea of last words is really meaningful and impactful. And, you know, of course they are. It's, you know, the last thing you'll do. So, I mean, it makes sense. But, but anytime you hear that in a movie, um, cheesy though it may be, it is sort of a, a, a kind of descendant of this cultural idea that still exists in that way. Uh, and then finally, um, and this isn't necessarily wrapped up with a good death, but it's kind of the pivotal, I guess, postscript um, to it. Uh, once the person, after they died, are buried and they're at rest, they're supposed to remain at rest and critically in one piece. Um, because if there is some sort of dissection, um, the, the idea is when Christ comes again, there needs to be sort of a physical body that is raised up. And so if there's some sort of dissection done, um, then you've sort of killed them yet again. Um, and for this reason, um, uh, autopsy, or sorry, um, a dissection was sometimes thought of as sort of an add-on to the executioner in terms of like an overkill. Um, and we'll get to this in a second. Uh, medical schools uh, were typically allotted the bodies of convicted criminals. And so this knowing that they will then be dissected um, the way that sort of the, the public and society thinks of this is this dissection is like another death, um, sort of death in the afterlife, uh, as it were. So um, that also, that, this provides the backdrop for everything we'll talk about. Yeah. And that, that bit about the section, too, reminds me of another 18th century thing. I'm on a 1700s kick today, I guess. Uh, there's that series of cartoons by uh, Hogarth called A Rake's Progress. And it follows sort of the, the moral descent of this guy. And the very last one is him being dissected after a hanging. And that was meant to be like, this is the ultimate disgrace. Uh, he, he earned this fate through his moral failings. Uh, so again, you're seeing these through lines uh, from the past, from the, the American past, the 1700s, uh, all the way to the Civil War. What is it about the Civil War that changes these things you've talked about? Well, before we get to the Civil War, um, the, the main thing that the Civil War changes has to do with um, sort of what's happening in the medical world leading up to this. So as far as most Americans are concerned, um, you know, death should be everything like I just described. So it happens at the home, they're put to rest, and they stay at rest, and that's, that's a whole deal. Um, medical schools in the kind of 1830s, 40s, and 50s are starting to put increasing focus um, less on this whole idea of the heroic uh, theory of medicine, the idea of balancing these four liquids, the four humors, the bloodletting with the leeches that you've probably heard of before. They're starting to leave that behind. I mean, it doesn't just go away, but they're doing increasing, they're increasingly focusing on the study of anatomy, on the human body. And you can read about, you know, um, the human body and textbooks and things all you want. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to kind of see what's in there. Uh, and 
prior to the advent of uh, and widespread use of uh, anesthesia for surgeries, there's not a lot of people volunteering for, uh, for surgery. Not a lot of surgeries are happening in hospitals or really anywhere. Um, so if you're a doctor um, and your center of curriculum is focused around the study of anatomy, uh, like you need to have some practical education. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, medical schools are allotted the, so anyway, if you, if you can't, you know, open up a living person, you have to open up a dead person. Uh, now this comes into direct conflict with this whole idea that bodies at rest are supposed to stay at rest, um, you know, rest in peace, uh, that whole idea. Um, that comes into direct contact with conflict with that. And so um, medical schools are typically allotted the bodies of convicted criminals, but you know, there's only uh, so many of those uh, every year. And so um, as a solution to this, medical schools turn to uh, body snatching, grave robbing, or um, great 19th century term for this, resurrectionism. Um, they go to the cemeteries to find these bodies to, to practice on. Um, now, for the most part, uh, in these body snatching escapades, um, they're gonna be digging up uh, poorer people um, because um, they have you know, fewer connections or fewer living relatives, might be harder to get in contact with. Um, uh, and in addition to poorer people, lots of people of color. Um, as in life, there is, it's, it's sort of interesting, you see, again, a stratification of society after death, um, which, is, which is fascinating. And in particular, and I know Kyle, this is sort of uh, something that you're sort of interested in, um, US Navy uh, burial grounds are in, uh, initially popular places to dig up dead bodies um, as, uh, you know, People in the Navy often have no family living nearby, depending on where they died. And uh, the Navy uh, was also a pretty diverse place, so lots of people of color um, there. So these are the places they're, they're getting their dead bodies. Um, now, as you can imagine, if the, in the, uh, the times this is discovered, it was not wildly popular. Um, with people when this was uh, when this was discovered, uh, and, and because of this, um, leading up to the Civil War, um, so from I can't remember what the the date range on here was, uh, from like the late 1700s to um, to 1860, there are about 17 different what are called anatomy riots um, across the United States. Uh, literal mobs of people that get together, they storm the local medical school in outrage uh, over the grave robbing, the body snatching, uh, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and I'll point to two specific um, examples to give you some, some idea of, you know, what, what, what this was like. Uh, in 1847, uh, someone living near medical school in upstate New York um, commented on this sort of situation. So he wrote, quote, last week, uh, a drunken Irishman struck his head on the pavement and killed himself. And the night after he was buried, some of the students from the medical school went to the graveyard to dig up his body for a subject to dissect, but they were shot at by someone uh, who was there to watch the grave. They've tried every night since, but have not been successful for the grave has been watched by other Irishmen. Last night, just before I went to bed, I heard a number of guns fired off in the direction of the graveyard, but I have not heard of the results. Um, and he's writing about this, you know, it's unusual, but not shocking news that something like this might be happening, um, which is, it's just kind of wild um, to think about. And then finally, um, this, there's this couple, um, their daughter died of a, uh, more rare or unusual disease. And they were so concerned um, that her body might be dug up for anatomical study. Uh, they buried her directly underneath their bedroom window. So they would always, they would always hear, um, you know, if should someone come to, to dig her up. Um, so all this very spooky, very scary, very uh, kind of disturbing. Um, and it's very much a different world than we occupy today, even though um, it really wasn't all that long ago, a couple hundred years uh, ago from now. 
And it's, it's uh, this. We actually have a, a question that sort of bridges that gap. Uh, John McFarland in the, uh, the comments here asks if you've ever taken an anatomy class. <laughs> uh, I did, uh, or no, I didn't take the anatomy class, but I've taken like biology classes in high school. Um, yeah, in college, you know, when I had to take, uh, I did, I, to graduate, I was required to have, um, take two math and science classes. And then instead of the sciences, which is more my wife's area of expertise, I'm pointing there like she's behind me, there's clearly no one here. Um, uh, it's more my wife's area of expertise. Uh, I took um, an astronomy class and a statistics class. Um, so I, I managed to avoid that, but I, I took some biology in high school. Um, I, I dissected a worm. I dissected a frog and a squid and a lizard, like a salamander or something. But I, I opted out of the, the pig. I was like, like, the, like, uh, like, like, like a little piglet. I was yeah. like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> hey, what about you, Kyle? Did you, did you dissect things ever in school? Um, when I was a kid, uh, we dissected, uh, I think, a frog. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, in, in college, I took some forensic anthropology courses. Oh, so wow. I handled a lot of human bones. Oh, my God. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was really my only exposure to it. Not a true anatomy course. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were all donated um, to the, the university with consent by the people to, who, to whom they belong. Uh, so a little different from what you're talking about. There were no riots uh, to get those... Uh, bones in our classroom. Right, right. Uh, yeah, a very different world. Um, and the, the Civil War is sort of um, a, a, a crucial pivot point here. Uh, well, and, and actually, I'll, I'll add one more note on the, uh, the body snatching stuff. And, and there's, I could go on for uh, a, a while just on this. Uh, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me. But anyway, um, Depending on the school, uh, it wasn't uncommon for just rogue medical students to just go out into the graveyard and do this just to get the uh, get the bodies. But uh, eventually, medical schools were like, "Okay, this is a bad look for us. We gotta we gotta do something about it." Um, and um, they it was pretty common for them to hire on um, someone whose kind of full time job it was to go grave robbing and, and body snatching. Uh, and they would basically like assign all of the medical students like, like a fee onto their tuition. So nowadays you go to school, you have like a, a library fee or like an athletic fee, you know, that gets you like access to, you know, the school gym or whatever, but they, it wouldn't have been itemized like this, but they would have had the body snatching fee, you know, in their, you know, tuition receipt, you know, when they had to, had to pay up. Um, so, and, and well, a great example, the University of Maryland, um, there was someone named Frank on their roles, no last name given, um, who was a, a janitor, um, who, who we know was a, you know, performed this function. And we have a great, uh, great post on our blog um, uh, about someone named uh, Grandison Harris, who I think what, performed that function for, I think the University of Georgia, somewhere in Georgia. Um, and it's, uh, pretty chilling story. Um, so go, uh, I think the title of the post is uh, A Better Man Never Lifted a Spade. Um, I'll find that and, and throw that in the comments um, real quick here. Yeah, uh, we can throw that into the, uh, the comments. I think that, that would be a, a good way to sort of let people uh, follow this track on their own. Um, one thing that separates, that I can think of right off the bat, um, one thing that separates the uh, Pre-Civil War era with, with this uh, fascination with grave robbing um, and the Civil War is the availability of corpses. Uh, mm -hmm. As you said, the criminals are sought after because there really isn't as much execution as a lot of people think there is in the 19th century and, mm -hmm. and 18th. Uh, and so there's not that many bodies available. When you get to the Civil War, there is a surplus of bodies. Uh, now, I may be preempting your point, but I assume that is just the scale of death is what changes uh, our, our approach to death and bodies. Uh, that, that's a huge contributor to that. Um, as Drew Faust says in this Republic of Suffering, um, you know, we tend to think of the Civil War, you know, as, as defined by 
you know, kind of redefining freedom. Um, there's all sorts of incredible and good legacies of the Civil War, but for Americans at the time, the defining feature of the Civil War was death. Like there was so much. <laughs> um, that's, you know, to this day, um, the Civil War is still the, you know, the, the deadliest war in American history. Now, of course, you know, we sort of get to cheat a little bit with that because we count casualties from both sides because they're all Americans, et cetera. But still, large numbers, you know, you know on, on both sides here. Um, and not only is there so much death, but it's the type of death that these people are experiencing. Um, so there's uh, um, all kinds of photography. I'm sure you've seen a lot of it. I'll do, I'll, I'm gonna share my screen here just to show a few examples. Um, but notably after the Battle of Antietam, um, a turning point in American history for a host of reasons. Of course, you got, uh, that leads to the pre preliminary emancipation proclamation, which changes sort of the, the nature of the war, making it a war um, make it union policy to be a, you know, a war for the, the abolition of slavery. Um, you have, you know, of course, a military victory there um, and, and the introduction of the Letterman system, um, which revolutionizes emergency medical care in the United States, all kinds of important legacies from Antietam. But another of them is a revolution in photography and uh, how that photography impacts, uh, impacted the American perception of death. Um, so uh, Alexander Gardner takes a number of uh, striking photographs of dead bodies on the Antietam battlefield. And so for the very first time, uh, or one of the first times, Americans are viscerally confronted with the reality of people dying outside the home. Um, so going contra to, again, this whole idea of the good death dying outside the home, they're not surrounded by anyone. Um, it, it's pretty gruesome and graphic death, um, inglorious. Uh, it's, it's just sharply confronting Americans with this reality that um, death is not exactly what they thought it might be. Um, so I'm just going to pull up a, a few of these images here. Um, from from that series that uh, Alexander Gardner takes. Uh, and, you know, these are all available online at the Library of Congress. And, you know, they, they have such high resolution files of this. I mean, you can really zoom in, um, you know, on some of these. And well, uh, William Frasinito has done some incredible work with these, but I mean, you can go in and you, you can actually read that headstone there. Um, you can see the facial expression on these people's faces. I mean, I can't overstate how shocking these images were. I mean, you just see the bodies and bodies piled up uh, on top of each other. And uh, again, another feature of the, the good death that, you know, this kind of exposes, um, you know, the idea that you know, who knows what these people's last words were. Their death may have been so sudden they didn't have time to give last words. So this, the brutality and the anonymity of, of this death is, uh, is just so striking. And there's, there's a host of them. And they were very publicly displayed in newspapers at the gallery in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and there's a great New York Times um, review of this exhibit and it says uh, something to the effect of if Mr. Gardner hasn't uh, dropped these bodies on our doorsteps, he's done something very much like it. Um, so this just sort of gives you an idea kind of, of of what they're confronted with and how kind of shocking this would be. So there's this, you know, the fact that death is everywhere. And now, um, right where you were getting to earlier, Kyle, suddenly there are now more bodies available to be dissected. And beyond that, um, the Union Surgeon General, uh, William Hamilton, actually makes it a requirement that these bodies be studied. Um, so this is all part of a, a shift with the study of anatomy and the Civil War really sets, uh, sets the medical profession off in this way. They're, uh, attempting to, you know, embrace the words profession, science, and get away from the words like trade or craft. Um, not that any of those, you know, those words aren't necessarily good, but that's the, the way that they're, they're almost making a conscious effort to brand themselves as a profession and a science um, by, you know, all of these dissections. And so William Hammond establishes the Army Medical Museum. 
uh, which still exists today. It's now called the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Really cool site. Definitely go there when you can um, at the end of the pandemic one day. Um, and he sends a circular out to all union surgeons, basically says, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you find anything interesting, um, send it to the museum. And at the end of the war, we'll publish you know, all of these case studies you do. Um, and so there's the carrot of, you know, oh, I'll get to be published. I'll contribute to, um, you know, to science and, and things like this. Um, you know, and, and there'll be some learning that comes from all of this. Uh, this education piece is critical. Um, and a, a letter that was written to Hammond in support of this whole venture kind of gets to the idea behind this. Uh, so if there's any benefit from the sad struggle of the age, it is that medical officers can fully justify looking for information and present the information for the world's future use. Use of limbs and organs and operations once deemed experimental will in future use be instilled to our confidence because of the keen, careful, and honoring eye of experience. Um, so it's this whole idea that there is a direct benefit that's going to come from this, this whole idea of learning. Um, now we're producers of medical knowledge because because we have access to all of these uh, all of these bodies that we didn't have access to before. Um, and it's an attempt sort of, uh, again, talking about branding. It's an attempt to kind of shine a light on the positives of dissection, um, as opposed to kind of this thing that was done in the dark. It was hidden, you know, creepy, body snatching, you know, doctors are kind of suspicious. And let me be clear, this whole kind of public relations campaign, which is you know, not necessarily an explicit effort, but that's, there's definitely a part of it. This whole public relations campaign um, that they're sort of attempting, um, it, you know, it's not universally uh, effective. I mean, there's still plenty of people that um, look at uh, doctors with deep suspicion after the Civil War and still aren't huge fans of medical school and the study of anatomy and all this sort of stuff. But it does change a lot of people's perceptions and it marks the first step into the world that kind of we know and occupy today, the world where Kyle and you know some forensic anthropology classes uh, has access to this sort of stuff. And uh, there's also, it, at the time, people who see the short-term benefits too. Uh, I was just reading about um, surgeon Joel Cullen Hall. Uh, he started with the 37th Tennessee, I think. He was a Confederate surgeon uh, and he rode to, rose to the rank of brigade surgeon in the Army of the Tennessee. And he would bring his um, sort of medics. They were supposed to be stretcher bearers. They did first aid, the infirmary corps. Uh, he would bring them to his tent and do dissections with them on the field. And these are guys who are most likely not doctors or even really nurses. These are like guys doing the most basic first aid in the field. But he felt that it was necessary that they get that hands-on training so they could be more effective when they got there. Uh, so this isn't even like the long-term uh, Union Medical Department, like we're going to collect these things and make volumes and build schools and museums. This was a, this is going to directly benefit us tomorrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, and, and just to you bring, bring forward another example, um, uh, John Brinton, a uh, fascinating person in his own right. He's the, the first curator of the, um, or maybe director, maybe both. Um, but he's pretty uh, high up in the leadership of the Army Medical Museum when it's first created. Um, and, and he frequently goes to um, you know, a number of these battlefields to kind of oversee the collection of these medical specimens to make sure the doctors are kind of writing these case reports, um, which I can't remember if I mentioned this, these case reports go on to become the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion, which you literally anyone can go read online right now. Um, it's not exactly a page turner, but it's full of incredible information um, and is much more useful if you kind of 
know how to search it and how to attack it, but um, super useful document uh, and full of just incredible information. And it um, wouldn't so be a uh, Civil War Medicine Museum live stream if we didn't drop that in there and say, this is the greatest source. It's so easy. It's everywhere. Uh, it is like our, our guiding books uh, and it's really a great source. And I know we talk about it in every video, but it is that good. Yes, yes. Um, so there, there are a number of instances where John Brinton kind of goes to the battlefields to, you know, in the, the aftermath to kind of, you know, make sure this is all happening. Um, and, and there's one particular instance, and I can't remember which um, uh, battlefield it's at. I think Jake's in the comments. He can probably remind me because Jake is more of an expert on Brinton than I am. But basically, um, they're in, in the course of doing many amputations and they eventually kind of bury the limbs and Brinton goes so far as to unbury the limbs and he kind of puts them in a sack and in a kind of demonstration, a show, he kind of dumps all of them out in the middle of this hospital um, and, and directed at the surgeon says, what good are these doing us in the ground? Um, and he's like, like give them to the museum so we can learn something. And it, that's a particularly striking and like kind of horrifying moment. But, you know, his point is trying to be like, this is terrible that this is happening and we're making it more terrible by not learning anything uh, from, you know, what we're doing here. And, and, you know, the whole idea is even if we can learn just one tiny thing from one of these limbs, then that's a win. Um, and, you know, the fact that so many people are losing their lives is enough of a loss that we'll take all the wins we can get. Um, but making that point in a much more dramatic and <laughs> kind of alarming way. <laughs> um, and now, of course, all of these limbs and medical specimens, you know, going to the Army Medical Museum, and of course, one of the most famous of those limbs is uh, Daniel Sickles' amputated leg. Um, was, so we are not the, the Army Medical Museum, National Museum of Health and Medicine. That's not, we're the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Sounds similar, but we're different. We, we get some people coming like, so do you guys have sickles leg? You're like, no, that, 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 that's the other guys. Um, but what, what often gets, you know, whenever people bring up sickles leg to like, oh yeah, you know, he used to go visit his leg all the time. Isn't that kind of weird? Uh, the thing that I always respond to, it's, it's, it actually wasn't that unusual for, because Sickles is far from the only person um, that has a limb or a body part in the museum that, that survived. Um, I mean, thousands and thousands of medical specimens are in their collection. And uh, we had the good fortune to go out there. They invited us out to go take a look at them. And a lot of them are on display, but there are plenty that aren't. And, it's just drawer, drawer full after drawer full of, you know, this is the leg section, here's the arm section. I mean, it's, it's wild, but um, it raises a few interesting questions. Um, number one, well, first of all, people did go and visit their limbs, um, you know, for sentimental reasons, for all kinds of reasons. Some of them wanted their limbs back. Um, and it raises, and this is something I'm not as familiar with, but it raises all kinds of interesting questions like, okay, well, did the army actually have the right to take these limbs in the first place? Uh, and one soldier who goes and asks for his limb back and uh, basically the rebuttal from the Army Medical Museum is like, well, you know, when you signed up, uh, you signed all of you up and uh, this part of you is still under service <laughs> or something and they end up keeping the limb. And, uh, but you know, it raises some kind of complicated questions. And those were brought to the fore again in the recent past. Um, uh, on the, uh, the Bull Run battlefield, there was a, a limb pit that was discovered. Um, and they brought us in to uh, consult to kind of discover some research uh, about, and we were able to find all kinds of interesting things, um, like who the surgeon was, who uh, conducted the operations, and um, you know, we had a small hand in it, but um, the, the question was, what are we supposed to do with these limbs? Like, should they go to the National Museum of Health and Medicine? Should they be, you know, uh, buried somewhere else? Or, you know, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of go back and forth on this all the time as to, you know, what exactly should happen to these things. And I, I think there were two almost full 
full bodies or maybe two entirely full bodies that were also buried in this limb pit. And I'm, I'm fairly certain those two bodies were interred at Arlington um, uh, a year ago now or something like that. Um, but it, you know, I, I don't know what I think about that, but this whole idea of the uh, Army Medical Museum and the limbs, it's like, uh, well, you know, what is actually the, <laughs> what, what should happen to all those? So it's tough, but you know, there's well, all kinds of go. different rabbit holes you can go, go down with this. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, uh, we do have a limb at the Frederick Museum. Uh, Civil War Trails uh, brought this up. Um, would you want to you want to talk about that for just a second? Like like what we know about it, why we have it, how we handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we well, and I'll also note we actually do have six um, things on loan from the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Um, six. Uh, bone specimens from them that are also on display, but they're not in our collection. Um, and and the, the neat thing about those six specimens we have, because we have the medical and surgical history, they, they each have a case history. So we know who they belong to, where they were injured, how they were injured, how they were treated. And we have all that posted in the museum kind of next to the the bone specimens. But the only bit of human remains that we have in our collection is it's referred to as the Antietam arm. Um, and it, it sort of raises more questions than, it, than we actually have answers for it. Um, it was found on or near the Antietam battlefield. Um, the Smithsonian did some testing on it for us years ago. Um, and they uncovered all kinds of super interesting things through some incredible science that is way beyond me. Again, I took astronomy and statistics in college. Um, so it's well beyond me. Um, and I have no idea how they figured this out, but they did. Um, the, the arm belonged to someone that was between 16 and 18 years of age. Um, so not implausible for a Civil War soldier. You technically had to be um, uh, over 18 to enlist. Um, but people got around that uh, with some frequency. Um, there's no, uh, you know, government issued ID really. Um, so anyways, between 16 and 18 years of age, they were from the Ohio Valley region. They were dehydrated at the time of death uh, and the arm was ripped. Uh, it's, it's basically a forearm. It goes from right around, you know, before the elbow all the way down to the fingers. The arm was ripped from the body, which could have been a cannonball. Who knows? Um, and that's about all we know. Um, did that arm um, see service in the Battle of Antietam? It's certainly plausible. Can we definitively say that it did? Not really. Um, but it's it, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting thing, and I think it might actually have a there may be another arm that's like kind of associated with it that's in like another museum in Boonesboro. I could be making this up. I hope I'm not. <laughs> um, I think it, it does have a partner um, of, I mean, I mean, obviously it did at some point, um, but I, I think, I think there's another one, but I'm not positive that's correct. So we've talked a lot about the body as a source of medical education in museums, in dissections, in medical schools, uh, but you did start the conversation about the nature of death, the way that people are supposed to die. Uh, and the obvious ways in which that's been undermined. How did Americans cope with that? I mean, there's only so much they can do to help it. Uh, so how did it change the way that we approach death? Well, one of the ways that the, the medical profession tried to, so how do you cope with that? You know, with any sort of, anytime there's uh, a sacrifice, great or small, um, you know, there needs to be some sort of meaning making and humans, kind of intrinsically do meaning making. We have to make meaning out of the world around us. Otherwise, you know, we're just kind of taking in stimulus and, you know, it's like, okay, what, what does this mean? We have to kind of assign some, some value to this. So how do you cope with this? It has to mean something. And one of the ways that the medical profession tries to do this is to say, well, here's what this means. All of this death hasn't been in vain we will learn something from all of this death. And if we kind of continue doing this and we kind of recalibrate how we think about death, we can continue to learn things. And this could not be a positive, but we could kind of make lemonade out of lemons as it were, maybe not a good analogy, but that, that, that's one way. Um, the other way, you know, that people are doing it sort of an, on an individual level, you know, they're, 
you're thinking, you know, my son, brother, um, relative, you know, is serving the country after death. Um, they were fighting for a noble cause. You know, you, you say, okay, well, what did they die for? Uh, and all this sort of stuff, you know, and, and uh, whenever people are notified, um, you know, their attempts to kind of convey, you know, notified that their relative has died or friend has died, their attempts to convey, you know, last words and to reassure them that, you know, it wasn't as gruesome as some of those pictures you've maybe seen. Um, and then, you know, uh, another way that people, I guess, cope with it is, you know, searching for missing soldiers. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, typically if, if someone is missing, it's because they're dead and they died. And, you know, this is the age before dog tags. And so Clara Barton famously leads the search for missing soldiers. Uh, and there's kind of a, another shift that happens. There's an attempt to um, try and identify for the American public um, those who never came marching home. That's kind of another shift. It doesn't really get to your answer of coping, but I guess people are kind of coping through action maybe. Um, and that whole kind of, um, attempt to search for the missing is, uh, you know, something that, of course, continues to this day. Um, so, uh, you know, there are all these things that, you know, they attempt to make meaning out of it, both, you know, what happens to the body after death if it can't be brought home. Um, there, you also see the rise of embalming during the Civil War, um, because if it's at all possible, people want to bring, you know, their relative home, even if they're dead, um, so they can be buried with their with their friends and uh, or with their family, I should say. And uh, if they're going to be shipped, um, you know, shipped via rail, most rail companies require the body be embalmed. Um, so there's a, a variety of ways that people come at it. Um, but what I want to make sure uh, gets across, you know, something that didn't happen. Um, there, you know, a lot of people are kind of recalibrating exactly, you know, how they think about death. Um, but it's not this sort of instantaneous, like, oh, you know, we were so foolish for thinking the way that we did, you know, about this whole good death idea. Um, everyone should be, di di should be dissected. You know, there's not a, you know, a tidal wave of sudden support for the medical community. But for the first time, in sort of a coherent and cogent way, um, the medical community is kind of making a case for why this shouldn't be viewed as, you know, a horrific, awful, gruesome, ghoulish, you know, all those things. Um, so there is that shift. But yeah, in terms of, you know, coping with this immense loss of life, um, you know, people turn to, um, you know, all kinds of places. And, you know, um, early Memorial Days, you know, the, the advent of Memorial Day is something that comes out of this, you know, grieving and honoring uh, the fallen and things like that. So, I mean, there are various things that come up, but I'm not as well versed in, in all that. Well, one that I know I've uh, come across is uh, the spiritualist movement. Mm, yes, uh, great one. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's already underway. It's a very, it's been around for a while in the Victorian period, but uh, I feel like the Civil War was just shoveling coal into the engine for that one, uh, where there are so many people who don't get an answer. Um, when I was working in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, which like Frederick had many hospitals throughout the Civil War, I found that 20% of the soldiers in those hospitals were still buried un unnamed. Uh, mm. they, were, they were buried unknown. And those were guys who like had tags on their bed with their name on it. Uh, they came directly from their regiments. It wasn't this post-battle scavenger hunt where there's corpses everywhere and some of them are unrecognizable. They knew who these guys were and you still had a one in five chance of being buried unknown. Uh, it's totally bonkers. So of course people are looking for closure in one way or another and spiritualism is a way to do that. Can you speak at all to spiritualism? Uh, what that means, uh, what, what it was? Yeah, uh, it's so spiritualism is sort of a movement that that does predate the Civil War. But um, like you said, it, it kind of swells, you know, it's this uh, idea that there is life after death, and that um, the dead can be contacted as individuals. Um, and there can be some sort of communication. Now, the form of that communication takes on all kinds of um, all kinds of shapes from, you know, the uh, more 
I guess what we think of as the more traditional seance, you know, the holy hands, like, you know, trying to contact someone um, to, you know, if, you know, under the right circumstances, if you hear a tapping, you know, that might be like a coded message from, you know, a deceased loved one or something like this. Uh, and of course, the most famous instance of this is um, there's a seance conducted in the White House uh, after um, uh, Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln's son, uh, Willie, I believe, dies in 1862. Yeah, that was um, Okay, Willie, yeah, and uh, it dies of uh, an epidemic um, in D.C. I'm struggling to recall what disease he dies of. I think it was cholera. I know it had to do with tainted water. Yes, yeah, it has something to do with the water. Um, uh, and so uh, Mary Todd uh, holds a seance, and Lincoln sort of kind of goes along with it, uh, and they attempt to contact Willie. But there's this, especially, you know, if you couldn't have heard you know, your relative's last words, they die on a Civil War battlefield, you know, you're desperate, you know, maybe the last time you saw them, you didn't think that that was going to be the last time you saw them, you just, you're desperate for one more, you know, one more bit of uh, communication. Um, and there are all kinds of people that kind of become famous through the spiritualist movement. Um, the, uh, the Fox sisters, I think, come to mind. Um, there, so there's, there's a number of people that kind of make a name for themselves conducting these readings and holding these gatherings and, and things like this. Um, and actually a, a delightful kind of medical conjunction of all this uh, comes from one of me and Jake's uh, favorite um, stories to ever exist. Um, it, written by Civil War surgeon Silas Weir Mitchell, um, who does all kinds of interesting pioneering work into nerve injuries. Um, during the Civil War, he writes um, as if it were a true account, a fictitious account of um, a soldier who had both legs amputated. Um, it's, it's, it was published in the Atlantic um, and, uh, uh, and it's called the, uh, the Case of George Dedlow. Um, again, this is not real, but he writes it as if it were true. It's super weird. That name is a little on the nose, Dedlow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. It's incredible. It's, uh, and so the, the case of George Dedlow, he, and I'm, I'm sort of giving away the ending here, but so spoiler alert. <laughs> um, uh, but he, he, like they're conducting a seance and they're trying to get in touch with something. And, you know, um, they, they hear this tapping noise and it's like Morse code. And George Dedlow, the, the double amputee is like, oh, wait a minute. Those are my legs because his legs were in the Army Medical Museum. They were tapping out their accession number at the Army Medical Museum. It's like a bizarre telltale heart situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, um, th th there's the intersection of uh, spiritualism and uh, civil war. Yeah, there we go. Brings it all the way back around. Oh, yeah. uh, do you want to give a shout out to Dr. John Willen uh, for pointing out that it's typhoid fever. Okay, uh, thank that you. That caused Willie's death. And Jake posted a um, uh, piece about uh, Willie in the comments, uh, as well as the case of George Dedlow. Uh, also uh, want to make it known, I know this is in the comments, but I'm going to say it out loud. Uh, we're going to do a reading of the case of George Dedlow on Halloween night. Stay tuned for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. I, well, so I, I didn't know if that had been officially announced yet, but I... I well, it's in the comments now, so it's announced. <laughs> yeah, well, so fantastic. So I... We'll be tuning in with bated breath. I am so excited for this. It's going to be story time with Jake uh, and George Dedlow. So uh, if you want to hear the whole thing in its entirety, it should be a, should be a lot of fun. I know. I'm and it's not a very long story, right? I mean, it's not short. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was, when Jake was telling me he was thinking about doing this, I, I looked it up. It's, uh, I think, 7,000 words. So okay, so not like crazy long. Yeah, but it's it's not like a like a picture book story. It's uh, yeah. It's, the New Bedford Whaling Museum does a live reading of uh, Moby Dick every year, and it takes days. Like people oh, yeah. just it's twenty four hours. It's nuts. I, we're not going to do that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're yeah. As part of a, a telethon to raise money for the museum, we're going to read through the entire medical and surgical history. <laughs> oh, Don't even joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, that's a brilliant uh, idea. We've only got a few minutes left. 
Um, do you have any final thoughts on the Civil War body? Anything you want to you want to bring up before we close out? Uh, just that, like you know, morbid, a little weird um, niche, as we said before. Um, but it, it's just one one more way um, that the Civil War um, fascinates me. Um, like. What I, what I say often to kind of conclude my tours at the museum, like Civil War medicine is not this kind of pre-modern horrific hack job that it's you know sometimes made out to be. Um, and it's also not like this super modern thing that like I think sometimes it can be tempting to suggest that it is. Um, it occupies this, what I think is a super interesting kind of in-between space. It's kind of somehow both at the same time. Um, and this is one more kind of example uh, of the ways, uh, in particular, the ways that the Civil War kind of lays the foundation or takes a first step towards this kind of more modern medical practice that we see today. It doesn't get there, um, but this is one way in which the Civil War lays the foundation for the way that we think about dead bodies today. Could you once again, uh, give us that list of books and we'll make sure it gets into the comments as well. So you can, this video is, is gonna be uh, permanently on our, our Facebook page. We'll have the written out list, but could you uh, just once more for the audience that's here, tell us the, the books that you mentioned at the top of the broadcast. Yes, um, so uh, This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War by Drew Gilpin Faust. Um, that's one a book. super good book, by the way, and a very depressing PBS miniseries. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, another one, Learning from the Wounded, The Civil War and the Rise of American Medical Science by Shauna Devine. Um, another fantastic book. And finally, A Traffic of Dead Bodies, Anatomy and Embodied Social Identity in 19th Century America by Michael Sapol. Um, they're all curious. fantastic. Um, yeah. They're um, all, you know, a little depressing as per the, uh, the subject matter. Um, but yes, those are the, uh, the relevant book titles. I got them, uh, I got them pulled up uh, and we'll make sure they make their way into the comments if Jake doesn't beat me to it. And I also suggest uh, that you pick those books up at our gift shop. Uh, I know we carry at least the first two. Yeah, uh, I'm not we, sure we, we carry the third traffic one. Of dead, we don't have a traffic of dead bodies, oh. but we do have the first two, yeah. Yeah, well, you can buy the first two in our gift shop, and you can save money on that by becoming a member. Uh, members are the ones who keep us float. I've seen quite a few of you in the comments. Thanks, everybody, for uh, popping up and, and saying hi. Um, members get 10% off in the gift shop all the time. And when you become a member, you get a coupon, and you can use that coupon uh, to get up to 20% off your purchase, entire purchase, uh, depending on the level that, that you join at. Members are the reason that we survive and thrive. Members are the ones who make us who we are. And we've had so many new members this year. It's been great. Thank you all so much for your support. We've seen a 142% uh, increase in new members over last year. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's been especially helpful for having our museum closed for so long, for seeing a decline in attendance when we did reopen. Uh, you're helping to keep us going. You're helping to keep this story, which is really important right now, uh, out here for people to see for free on our, our various channels. Uh, so thank you all, uh, all of you members, uh, and those of you considering becoming members. Uh, we, we really appreciate all the ways that you've pitched in and made us who we are. Uh, John, any final thoughts before we, uh, we log off? Uh, that's about it. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing some of you coming in and hopefully getting some of the, some of those books, uh, the, this weekend. I'll be at the desk this weekend, so hopefully I'll see some of you there. All right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for joining us, uh, from around the country and around the globe. We have a viewer from the Netherlands, uh, and, uh, I hope that we'll see you all again soon. All right. Till next time, everyone. I think we're clear.